Do you remember the 1930s? The world was in a craze of new fantastic technologies. Technologies that would help us break boundaries, know each other better and help us live in peace? Do you remember the 1950s, where the miracle of atomic energy was going to turn our life upside down for the better? Atomic spaceships, nuclear medication, the atomic cities under the ground. We were on the verge of living the dream of science fiction. Do you remember the 1990s? I certainly do. This time it was the information superhighway that was going to revolutionize our life. We would have the power to write instant messages to people all over the world, download music, watch pictures of cats, and buy products through the interwebs. Every generation has its own set of buzzwords. And if you want to be considered as someone with a finger on the bit, you should be using them. Stay with me and you might just be surprised. Among many trends of the last 10 years, we can mention the rapid development of the electronic technology and the growing awareness to climate change. Those two trends might have led many companies or individuals to use two buzzwords, sustainability and innovation. Although those two terms are very different, I think they are linked in many levels, which I'm going to talk about in this video. Now, let's start with some uh, background. What is sustainability? In a nutshell, it is the ability to endure or continue. We have a limited amount of resources and an unlimited amount of desires. If we manage our resources correctly and adapt our desires accordingly, then we are sustainable. Take, for example, a cup with a hole at its lower end. Now put it under the tap. Water from the tap is filling it up and it also runs out through the hole. As long as the amount of water coming out of the hole is no larger than what is filling the cup, we can look at the situation as sustainable. The cup will never run dry. In many cases, when people are discussing sustainability, they're talking about natural resources and the use of them. One of the biggest issues is the fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are decomposed plants. Those plants lived millions of years ago and they absorb the CO2 from the atmosphere. Now today, when we burn this fuel, we are basically releasing this CO2 that which they absorbed millions of years ago back to the atmosphere. Natural forests are a part of this equation because they absorb CO2, which we burn, for example. Now, as long as there are enough natural forests which absorb CO2 and generate O2, then it's okay. But the problem is when we generate more CO2 than the natural forest can absorb, then this is a non-sustainable and actually very dangerous situation. You can also look at the animal farming as a non-sustainable model. Over one third of the agricultural land on this planet is used for growing food to feed animals. The problem with animals is that they need a few years to live until they're being used as food. During this time, only by living, they consume a lot of energy, energy that is not transferred to whoever eats them. And that is very inefficient energetic wise. The economy is a major factor when it comes to discuss sustainability. Because if the only people who can be sustainable are the one who can afford to be sustainable, 
then it's a lost game. Thinking sustainability is thinking poor. Humanity is using every year between two and three times more natural resources than the planet can actually provide. Buying a new expensive electric car is not a sustainable act by itself, especially if this car is powered by non-sustainable energy sources. Take a look, for example, on advertisements from times of scarcity. You can see that people were encouraged to use less and to recycle more. Resources had to be managed in a more careful way. If to summarize the notion of sustainability, it is there because we benefit from it in the long run. Economic motives are where sustainability and innovation meet each other because we can look at both of them as tools. If we are authentic, we are investing our ingenuity in both of them to reap success and benefits in the future. We are not doing this for the sake of mentioning the fact that we are using them. So, what is innovation? A simple way to explain it is to compare it to the opposite state of status quo, where we accept things the way they are because we are used to them or because we were told that this is how things are. A client of mine asked me once if a product I was designing for them could be 3D printed. I realized that they were just interested in the concept of 3D printing and had no idea what were the implications. Of course, after explaining what are the drawbacks and the advantages, we agreed that 3D printing in that case was not the right way to make what they needed. A 3D printer, a pencil and a piece of paper, CAD software, laser cutting machine, all of them are tools which are there to help us realize our goals. Simple as that. Innovation is also a tool. It is a little bit more abstract than what I mentioned earlier, but it is still a tool. Innovation happens when a person or a group of people manage to find connections among dots which no one could see previously. Now, don't confuse innovation and invention. These are two completely different things. The bicycle was an invention. Adding an electric motor to a bicycle and creating a new market niche is innovation. An interesting story is the invention of the industrial robot by George Deval. The robot itself is an invention which led to a radical innovation in the industry. Instead of humans doing repetitive work, which is to some degree goes against their nature, the robot can do it way, way better. A small disclaimer. I personally think that robots that take over repetitive tasks from people is a good thing. And why is that? This is because if we think about ourselves, we are humans, we are not the fastest runners, we don't have the strongest muscles, we don't have the best eyesight yet. We reached achievements which are way beyond any other existing animals. Why is that? Because of our brains. Our brain is the most powerful organ in our body. Therefore, when we build on people not using their brain powers, but instead doing repetitive small tasks, that's to some degree a way to go against the human nature. George Deval, who was working on his invention of the industrial robot, at some point teamed up with Joseph Eagleberger, who was a business person, and he was traveling around factories trying to figure out how to create innovation based on what this robot could offer. An interesting side story is that although GM started to use those robots in one of their car factories in the early 1960s, the general mood in the US was mainly derived by sci-fi ideas that robots are evil, they're going to take over the world and kill everybody. 
Therefore, at the end of the day, they found a lot of open ears in Japan, where this idea of uh, evil robots was not part of the culture. During those 20 or so years, many Japanese companies integrated robotics in their manufacturing lines in a very organic way. Now we jump to the 80s when GM wanted to reintroduce again innovation in their factories. GM invested a lot in introducing robotics into their manufacturing lines just for the sake of having robots there and not for the sake of authentic innovation. Some say that this step was the first one that actually led to their downfall. If you are interested in this topic of robotics and industry, I'm going to add some links in the description below so you can learn more about it. Did you know that the ancient Romans had a water wheel? The same water wheel which is responsible in many ways to the industrial revolution, yet another example of innovation, had been used by the Romans, but the Romans had slaves. And slaves are cheap. Slaves are cheaper than investing energy in developing new kind of technologies, which might have led the Romans to enter an industrial revolution over 2000 years ago. The example of the Romans, the water wheel and the slaves is very similar to our times. Why? Because instead of slaves, we have oil. And since oil is so relatively cheap, it prevented investments in alternative energy sources until very, very recently. You see, this is where sustainability and innovation are blocked by short-term economical goals. And that's why we could not benefit from them in the long run. Another place where sustainability and innovation meet together is when they clash with the culture. I would like to compare also this sense of fear of killing robots in the 1950s and 60s to the contemporary fear of atomic energy. It took robots way too long to be introduced into manufacturing processes because of cultural fear that was based on scientific novels. We might have given up the opportunity to be completely free of fossil fuels by now and enjoy an abundance of clean electric energy that could have been produced by nuclear reactors. Nuclear reactors pose their own risks. However, the fact that nuclear energy is the same one that has the potential to warm our homes and cook our food, and on the other hand, cause a complete destruction of humanity and this planet, this might also add to the lack of its popularity. So, as you can see, the ideas of sustainability and innovation go hand in hand in many levels, just like this hook and this key. During my career as an industrial designer, I went through many brainstorming and innovation sessions with companies and entrepreneurs. I love this contagious energy of creativity and also this feeling of satisfaction after finding those elusive connections. You see, this screwdriver is a tool and you will only use a screwdriver when you actually have to drive screws. You will never think of using a screwdriver just for the sake of saying, I'm using a screwdriver, right? When you're approaching innovation, you must always ask yourself those two basic questions. The first one is, what am I aiming for? Where do I want to be? When you have this question answered, then you should ask yourself, what tools 
do I need in order to get there? It's always goals versus tools. Never mix them because they never taste so well together. Those two questions which I just offered are a great start. But the process that leads to real good innovation has way more into it. If you are interested in learning more about powerful tools that will help you innovate, you're welcome to contact me. I left contact details in the descriptions below. Thank you for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.